bridging vision and language with data from perception to understanding. Um, so why vision and language? There are multiple real world problems that can benefit from better vision and language models. For example, in doctors can ask questions about medical images, like what is the organ system in this image? And visually impaired people can use the, their mobile phones to help them navigate and buying uh, groceries at the, at the supermarket. And actually, one of the premises of artificial intelligence are agents that we can communicate with in natural language, and they can perceive the environment and take actions in the physical space. And actually, now it's easier to convince why vision and language is interesting. And these examples from a GPT-4 showing cases where you can take pictures from your fridge and ask GPT-4 to come up with food recipes uh, based on what it sees in, in your fridge. And now I want to talk about uh, reasoning beyond recognition and to try to explain and to try to explain that uh, recognition and data sets like ImageNet and MS Coco are not the main bottlenecks uh, nowadays. And to illustrate it, I want to ask you what makes these images weird. So take a second and try to look, for example, on this image and explain what makes it weird. Carrot is too big. The lighting of the carrot. Okay. No. Why would she use carrots? Yeah, right. Okay, this is the correct answer. It is cucumbers, usually because it, it contains some kind of moisture uh, elements that help to reduce uh, sourness in the eye. And okay, and this one is easier. What about this one? Right. And the right one is like a reverse uh, roll. Okay, cool. So in all of these cases, there will no problem with the recognition of the items. We just need to uh, reason about it. And AI needs to be grounded in the real world to achieve full common sensibility. So this is like the motivation for uh, reasoning beyond recognition. Uh, now, uh, my personal uh, agenda, and this is a personal uh, and subjective uh, direction, is that building successful AI systems in the upcoming years will largely depend on the availability of high quality data sets that represent challenging tasks rather than improving modeling techniques. And this is the direction that I take in, in my uh, research. And while this is subjective, there is a growing body of research that also supports uh, this direction. Uh, for example, there is um, a known work uh, from Google, everyone wants to do the model work, not the data work. And one uh, interesting quote is that paradoxically, data is the most undervalued and deglamorized aspect of AI. Yeah, I think you're wrong. The data doesn't matter. You just need to train a model with 500 trillion parameters. Yeah, we can we can yeah, discuss this. But you need data for that. <laughs> so you can argue about the quality. Yeah. Um, um, okay, uh, let me try to convince you a bit more. No, we are already convinced. Let, let's talk about uh, Instruct GPT, for example, right? They, they take the same architecture with 175 uh, billion parameters, and from reaching from here to here, this is the Likert scale, um, and, and they increase significantly uh, how much people love their, their responses for the models. Uh, by only adding a uh, high quality uh, around 1k instances of uh, uh, beneficial data. And this is before adding the RL stuff. This jump is from adding the RL, but this jump is only taking the SFT and uh, only with fine tuning. And there is another work, uh, it's called DataComp, uh, which I was lucky to be a part from, uh, the machine learning benchmark where the models are fixed and the challenge is to find the best possible data. And this is a multi-model work where uh, we take like the Lion 5B, 5B uh, image and text pairs, and the task is to find uh, 400 million pairs uh, that are the most beneficial, meaning that when you take a, a clip-like model and you train this model on the uh, split, it will um, surpass the original clip model and achieve the best possible performance. So this is the data comp work. And lastly, uh, I guess you know uh, Lima, less is more for alignment, where they show that, okay, just taking uh, 1,000 samples can uh, yield performance that is almost good as GPT-4. 
uh, okay, so this is a bit of motivation for works about data. Now, my methodology of uh, executing this uh, um, agenda is first to push the bandwidth, bandwidth of vision and language with challenging data sets, and it resulted in publications in Michael 21, Europe 22, and AAA 23. And second, to improve vision and language model generalization, and resulted in publications in EMNLP 21, ICCV 23 submissions, and a few other submissions uh, as well. Now, in the following slides and presentation, we will see uh, how to think and create creative tasks and to employ tailor-made solutions, uh, leveraging rich semantic inputs, for example, whether it is syngraphs, which represent images uh, in some kind of uh, discrete uh, graph, uh, contrastive perturbations, cross-model analysis, crowdsourcing, smart filtering, gamification features, the recru recruitment of experts, and finally, leveraging LLMs and text-to-image models. Okay, um, so in this work, I guess you're familiar with the concept, and if you're not, I will just explain it quickly, the concept of contrast sets or challenge sets. And actually, uh, I think many people from this uh, uh, NLP group were a part, uh, like a few years ago, were a part, a part of a work about contrast sets, where they showed that when you take an um, NLP uh, test set and you then create minimal changes in each test uh, instance, um, the performance really drop, um, um, like state-of-the-art performance uh, drop. And it shows that while we, we thought that the performance is good, when we have like minimal changes that shouldn't affect the model so much, uh, actually it does uh, affect it. And uh, it makes, uh, it, it, we realize that the performance wasn't really good as we thought. It just was a problem with evaluation. So uh, in this work of automatic generation of contrast sets from syngraphs, um, with the, the problem is visual question answering. For example, is there a fence near the puddle? And we have some ground truth answer of yes. And then we take the image and we look on the syngraph of the image. And in this work, this, uh, there is a data set where the syngraphs are uh, manually annotated. And, and syngraphs uh, represent the image and saying, for example, which are the objects in the image, what are the attributes of each object, and what are the relationships between objects. For example, that there is a zebra, and the zebra is behind the fence, and the fence uh, has an attribute of a uh, made of wood, a wooden fence, uh, and so on. So taking this syngraph, we made manual, we, we made automatic perturbation, for example, creating is there a wall near the puddle, are there men near the puddle, and is there an elephant near the puddle. And when we take the state of the art models, we see again that the performance drop. But differently from the previous work in the NLP task I, uh, we, we described, this is done automatically. And the, follow, the previous work was done like a manual. So they, they had many NLP researchers uh, manually changing uh, stuff in the in the test instances, and we leverage the syngraphs to do it automatically. And since it, this is automatic, we can then generate and activate the same uh, perturbation during training, and this way expand and augment the training set, and this way to achieve a more robust models. Okay, so this is um, the first uh, the, the contra sets work. So basically, you use this for data augmentation. Yeah. And also, the model strain of the original data set, which was what, what's this? Is it MS uh, This is GQA. GQA. So you show that they, the model strain of the original GQA fail on these types of perturbations? Yes. It, the performance drop. It doesn't fail completely, but like from 84, uh, it, uh, the performance dropped to like 68, I so think. So it seems like in all of these automatically generated questions, the thing was that you're asking about a, about an entity that does not appear in the image at all. So that stuff that's not in the original GQA, when they ask questions, they always assume that the, the, um, that the question would appear in, in it? Uh, no, so this is a great question. Th there are multiple like type of questions in the GQA, and uh, we also in the paper show several cases, for example, uh, taking an entity that 
uh, does not exist and asking about an entity that does exist and vice versa and changing the relationships. For example, uh, is the cat is to the left of the oven or, and then we change it to, to, to the right. And even like open-ended questions and not only binary, like asking about colors or asking about the attributes. So we had several options. Could you do an ablation to see if the game is from the contra set or from the augmentation? For example, for the number of examples, and in one case, it's the all contra sets, but in another case, it's different images. Um, so we did have uh, like several, we experimented with a number of generations per instance. For example, having one uh, um, perturbation and three and five, and then we had the, the contrast sets consistency as that they find it in the Matt Gardner's uh, work where uh, when you have like a neighborhood of five um, perturbations, uh, which are all of, with the same label, you expect that the model will be consistent on all meaning that maybe failing on all or succeeding on all. Um, and if it is like a half, then it means that it is not consistent enough. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, so yeah, I, I just want to add, this is like, uh, we will show uh, several works and this is like a very highlights uh, presentation and you're very welcome also to check out the papers themselves and also to like to, do, to discuss uh, later. Uh, if you're interested about any particular work. Okay, now another type of works are common sets benchmarks. And we are all know, uh, and okay, so there have been many, uh, I need to remember that you are not uh, from NLP, so I will give more, a bit more background. So there have been many um, NLP common sense benchmarks in the previous years. For example, in two, 2012, there is a Winograd schema challenge, uh, if you're familiar with it. And uh, later there, there have been Win of Grande and Win of Gender and uh, many works by Yejin Choi, which is a researcher that uh, her students uh, her, have many common sense benchmarks. And we asked, uh, can vision and language models handle common sense tasks? And how can we develop and create more challenging and less alterable benchmarks? It means that benchmarks that when, when we create a benchmark in 2022 will be still relevant, hopefully in 2025. So we developed three benchmarks to test it. And now we will show just, just the task of each benchmark and, and each work is like a full paper. Uh, so this work is uh, about visual analogies. So if you are familiar with word to back analogies, men to women is like him to queen. Now let's try to do the same with images. So you have four images here, A, A prime, B, and you need to find the B prime that is most similar to B the same way as A prime is similar to A. So you have four candidates and try to select uh, the image uh, that best completes the analogy. What would you select? Good. <laughs> okay, you are first in this group. Uh, great, so, and, and in this work, by the way, we leverage a visual SRL, visual semantic labeling, which describes for each image, we have like the agent that is performing some activity and the items that the agent is using and the tools and like the place that the agent uh, appears in and so on. So here we have like a man swinging on a tree and here we have a monkeys or apes swinging on a tree. So if here we have a man shivering in the cold, in B prime we should have something like a, a monkey or, or apes or maybe like two apes uh, shivering in the cold. And when we look on the candidate below, the best uh, fitting one is uh, number three. Okay, cool. Now, uh, uh, the next one uh, is um, similar to the game Codenames. And are you familiar with the game Codenames? Codenames, yeah. So, okay, so you have a Q werewolf, and you need to select the two uh, associations that best fit the, 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 like the best associates with the queue. So the queue is a werewolf, and which of these two images, like which uh, images uh, from here, are the two images that best fit to the queue werewolf? The Correct. Good. Now, um, the interesting part about this benchmark is that we address the limitations of static benchmarks. So we actually developed some kind of game, an online game, 
a deployed game that people can play with and uh, as a side effect a beneficial and like high quality data will be created. Um, and the game has a, a model in the loop and hopefully we can like change the model and, and develop it to stronger and stronger models as, as like the uh, AI models uh, keep uh, on developing. And in this way, the data will uh, be adjusted and challenging to future models as well. So the game works is that we have a spy master, Alice, and Alice uh, has a task uh, to create uh, an association instance like a queue and uh, images, given uh, several images, and she needs to satisfy two conditions. First, it should uh, fool an AI model, so it should fool uh, this one in the clip model, and second, it should be solvable by three human solvers. So we didn't want only to like to fool to fool the AI because in this way uh, the, mo the the data can also be like random random noise like just gibberish uh, string it will fool the AI but it won't be solvable by other other people. Uh, so we actually hired uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk workers to play our, uh, this game and they received a very nice bonus that is correlated to the full the AI score and the solvable by human score. So this is the Winogavir work. Yes, uh, the question. So uh, the workers are given multiple choice questions, uh, multiple choice options here, right? They yes. They need werewolf, and then they need to decide on the correct answer. It's very limited. Uh, doesn't that make the data set very easy to solve? Um, easy? OK, so. The, the the workers are re rewarded very nicely for um, being able like to fool the the, the cliff model uh, in this case and we show in the paper that even if you take the weakest clip model like clip rn50 uh, it creates data that is also challenging for much larger and order of magnitude uh, bigger models um, and no like the, the answer is that this data set is very challenging and like this may be a, a bit of easier association, but there are associations that are pretty challenging. And this is only because like, because of the re reward uh, technique that really made the workers uh, think really hard on a, a creating creative uh, instances. How many examples did you Yes, so we have around uh, 3.5K, I think. And like, there are from, uh, some with five images, six Im images, and also 10 and 12. So the more uh, candidates you have, uh, like the lower the random chance is as well. Yes, yes, this is very like inspired by common sense uh, 2.0. Uh, like one, one difference is um, like the gamification um, um there have been oh so yeah so common sense 2.0 had also the gamification yeah. uh, we did like develop this game and and uh, designed it to be dynamic so evolving over time as well like uh, we can take the collected collected data like now and and update the new version of the game with like a version of, I don't know, June 2023. Uh, yeah, but we don't really do it. And uh, <laughs> one, one last question, just curious. Um, what happens if you do this nice little model to solve your test? Uh, the first model just classifies what's in the picture. So you get for this uh, cute werewolf, you get uh, drugs. I don't know what that is. The second thing, dog, syringe, and moon. And then you take Chat GPT and ask it which word out of the following is the closest to werewolf? Yeah. Dog, moon, syringe, drugs, or the yeah, I probably think, Chat GPT would be able to. Yeah, I think we did this experiment in the did we do this experiment in the paper? I don't really remember. Uh, it's very obvious that dog is close, it's very close to werewolf, and moon is extremely close to werewolf. Yeah, this is correct. Uh, I'm pretty sure we did have something like this. I need to check. But like the, the answer is that some cases are uh, can like be solved with uh, like 
transferring everything to text. But uh, other cases can be like we had um, a very challenging category. We called it non visually salient um, um, associations. So, for example, you can have like some kind of shape. So there is an image, and like you can say that the view is a triangle. And th there is a concept, I don't know, like a house, but the house is looks like a triangle. So th th this is like the cube. And in this way, when you turn uh, it to text, uh, the textual representation won't say anything about like a house that looks like a triangle, for example. So this is like a very, um, this type of associations, uh, and we, we, we were aware about, about this like easy baseline to solve. That's why Okay, yeah. Question about that. Um, are all the examples uh, views or like for a single object inside or those like more complicated, um, let's say, like mm. association? I mean, you have a single dog, you have a syringe, that's a single object. And it multiple times, but still, the image is, is kind of like yeah. quite easy. So I'm kind of like asking if. They'll. they'll... There are um, images that are more like um, complex than that. I don't know. The blue shot shouldn't be blue, which is like a blue Yeah. So there are uh, images with com more complex uh, structure. Like for this one, for the example, I just search for something that is cool and will be easy to to understand. <laughs> Yeah, so this relates to his question, and, and I'm pretty sure that we did have ah. this uh, experiment in the paper, and I will search later and uh, let you know. And yeah, okay. The next one is about figurative language, and figurative language is something that we as humans use all the time. For example, in this case, there is some soccer player, and I don't know anything about soccer, but he was said that he jumped off the sinking ship just in time when he left Chelsea. So I just understand that probably Chelsea didn't have a very strong season, and he left them to a better, um, a, a better group, a, a better team. So we developed a, a benchmark to test this figurative language, language understanding. For example, we have, a, we have, so we have phrase like let the cat out of the bag, which is a phrase with the definition of to disclose a secret. And the answer, what, like the task is to select the best fitting image. And this is the best fitting image. Uh, so one uh, child telling uh, another child a secret. And blanket of snow, it is not a photo of a blanket of and no of this snow a uh, snowflake here, but something that actually looks like a blanket of snow. Uh, so this is uh, this work, which is uh, also submitted to EMNLP right now. And in the pictures you proposed, you proposed also a picture that uh, matches literally the uh, expression. Yeah, yeah. So we had like a figurative um, explanation of the image, and we had literal uh, meaning of the image, like literally showing items from the trail in the image. So these are like very strong distractors and stuff that we experimented with. But, but not only like a separate image, for example, uh, literally a picture of a cat coming out of the bag. Not a bag yeah. or a cat, but a picture and, of a cat. Yeah, so I'm not sure like how many of these we did found, but um, but yeah, we try like to search for uh, this type of distractors, and we show that like clip models and very uh, many other clip uh, many other vision language models, um, uh, like tend to give much higher scores to the literal definitions, to the, the, the literal images rather than the figurative images. And we also have cases where the image is both literal and figurative. Uh, so we had several categories there, and the paper showed the analysis over all of these uh, types and what are the scores of each one, and we then like um, trained um, the clip uh, embeddings to better understand this this type of uh, um, data. Oh, it's a bit 
logical, no? For fleet, at least. Like, it's not framed in uh, yeah. understanding uh, expressions, but rather fitting uh, a uh, caption to an image. Yes? Yeah. This is correct. Like, the, the, the clip is framed more uh, on similarity and recognition. And so this is this isn't the, like the comfort zone on clip, but we do want some model to be able to solve it. So we took all the state of the art vision language models in that time and tested them on the data and then also trained several models to better understand this type of data. And actually just training on this uh, really is really effective. Uh, so uh, you can easily improve your model uh, to better understand this figurative uh, speech. How did the, actually this, I have a to diffusion and maybe that's the form that you're looking at? Um, so like what are the performance of the models? Yeah, like text image, diffusion model, yeah. whatever. Uh, diffu so we didn't models. test diffusion models on this kind of, like diffusion, uh, diffusion yeah. models. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I don't remember all like all of the results, I but just, I just saw something on Twitter that like you see uh, um, uh, you're at, you ask for a for a yellow uh, flamingo and um, and a pink sunflower and it gives the reverse. Uh, yeah, and he, like completely okay. yeah. ignores your request. Yeah, so but this is a different uh, <laughs> like a bit of different task. This is like compositional understanding. And in this way, this is like figurative figurative. Uh, language and like just up from the top of my head i think that like the figurative um, images uh, had a, a performance of around 50 or maybe 60 percent and the literal uh, images received uh, around like 90 90 percent so clip is more, much more likely to to match to the literal uh, image okay. well, to try to ask now we choose to create yeah. the image of blanket of snow. Would it create? Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so okay, this is a great question. And we had a part in the uh, paper where we take Dali and we generate like blanket of snow and try to have like, and, and it fails. Like our pipeline, uh, which is composed of like many manual steps as well. So like our semi automatic pipeline. Is much more uh, like much better in uh, creating uh, figurative images. But like with that being said, I really believe in the abilities of text-to-image models when prompted correctly. Like we need to figure out what is the correct way to prompt these models and what uh, what what is the, like the the prompt. Right now they don't capture the meaning of the figurative yeah. Yeah. But again, what? Right now they don't capture. Yeah. The meaning. Right. Like they out of the... out of the. Out of the box, it doesn't capture the meaning, but like I, I think that really easily you can do incredible stuff that will capture the figurative speech. Yeah, but again, you can maybe try and go through the text. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I completely agree with this, like, like there are two points, like, I agree that there is a, a better way to use text to image models to create such images, but when we're given these kind of images, uh, there might be an easier way to solve it or break it. Uh, so far, like uh, these uh, methods did not like there haven't been like a, a recent problem to do it. And this is a um, pretty pretty like new benchmark. And yeah, we will be happy if people will work on it and uh, propose better ways to solve it. Yeah. Just one question for me: Did you try uh, like some uh, recent problem, for example, maybe GPT-4 that has a frozen uh, text uh, llama 13 billions that I believe will be better fitted to understand the figurative uh, meaning of uh, uh, like these expressions. Uh, um, yeah, so, yeah, so I know what you're talking about. And what, no, we didn't try it in this paper, mm -hmm. uh, but worth, worth trying. OK. Uh, Okay, cool. Um, and we had like several ways of 
also improving and trying to some modeling techniques to improve over this data set. And just like a very quick one is that we had like a bit embeddings from the images in the analogy cases. And we had this arithmetic representation, B plus A prime minus A. And then we received like a single vector. And now we can search for the candidate that is most similar to, to this uh, single uh, vector. Um, and in other works, like, so now I'm showing like uh, all of the works that we uh, saw before, and we will touch uh, in groups. Uh, 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 I, I didn't show this one, uh, but we will see. And so we take state of the art models and we test them on these challenging data sets. And the bottom line is that all data sets are easy for humans and challenging for models. So these are the, the words of the quantum set, analogies, associations, and metaphors. And this is the best model, like Alex Mertz, Wing Transformer, Build, Clip. And, um, and here we see the best model performance and the human performance. And again, we have like a very, uh, currently we have a big gap between human performance and model performance. So this is how we try like to test and like expand, uh, push the boundaries of vision and language models. Uh, but again, we also generated training sets in this task. So maybe the training sets were generated uh, synthetically, like silver data without human labels, or in the analogies, uh, sorry, in the associations, we had a uh, human annotated data from the game, the online game. And when we take these created uh, test sets, we were able to also improve. So here we have the performance game on taking the zero shot model and see where we can get with fine tuning. So again, this is a, a simple, a pretty simple fine tuning, no uh, sophisticated modeling techniques, but we were able to, to improve over the zero shot performances. And actually like it also showing, it also shows that uh, the graded data sets serve as beneficial training data. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah, so this is like one way uh, we created better model uh, to solve the analogy. So this is this uh, work. It's not like a vision and language. Yeah, the analogy is mostly all, all. Yeah, it's vision only. Like the way that we did leverage the visual SRL. So when generating the data, uh, we use the NLP and text and WordNet and FrameNet and uh, like very NLP stuff. Okay. Uh, okay, this is another work, but I will skip this one. And I want to talk about three other works, like a bit more in uh, details and getting uh, a bit more uh, to, to and showing more, more details from the work. And the first one is uh, Q2D, turning questions into dialogues to teach models how to, how to search. And this is a bit of a, a detour because this isn't a vision and language, it is only text, but the relation and the similarity to the previous work is how to generate beneficial data and how to improve models and tasks uh, with data. So dialogue models like Lambda and Bar communicate with an external stage API to generate factual responses. So we can talk with uh, your favorite dialogue model about the TV series like Breaking Bad, and then you can ask, do you know how many episodes are in this season? And then the model will generate a search query, how many episodes are in season two of Breaking Bad? And uh, it will be fed to a search API, and then the model will generate a, a factual conversational response. So this is, this is how these models are trained. Now, the, the, the problem is that training data for this task relied on human annotation. And it means that it is not uh, scalable enough. And when we have like a distribution shift or a new type of dialogues, the model, like Lambda model, for example, wasn't able to, 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 to parse and understand the new dialogues correctly. So this is like a real world uh, case uh, from Google, where we had the Lambda team say, okay, query generation sucks. 
when we have new type of dialogue, how can we solve it? And we propose Q2D, with, which is an automatic pipeline to generate data for query generation. And I will show in the next slide exactly how this pipeline works, but uh, like, uh, let's talk about what the pipeline provides. So first, we, will, we show that we can re fully replace human annotated data with a, a synthetic data and reach uh, between 90 and 97% of the performance. And second, we were able to generate data for new domains, uh, and we will show what it means in, in the dedicated slide. And lastly, we showed an intrinsic evaluation of the generated dialogues, uh, showing that they are natural, uh, factual, uh, and correct. And so, again, that, that's, uh, I know it is a bit, may, maybe a bit complex, but we started, okay, so we have, th th this is how the data for query generation looks like. So we have a dialogue uh, which has some meaning, some uh, intent. And we have a search query, and the search query has the same intent as the dialogue. But the dialogue is like de de uh, contextualized and long, and the search query is the decontextualized the presentation. And then the search query will uh, be fed to the search API, and in this way you can receive a much uh, more updated results. Like you can ask how old is Joe Biden, and this question has a different answer in each year. Okay, you're welcome to check the paper for uh, the full paper to see everything, but let's talk about the pipeline. So, again, data for query generation has dialogue and query. This is the data that we need to train on. So, how can we create this data? How can we uh, automatically generate such data? So, we can search for like lambda logs and finding dialogues and then generate queries for them, but it will uh, um, uh, like require us to solve the task that we need to, to solve, right? So let's try to reverse to reverse the, the, the order. So starting, instead of generating di a, di a query from dialogue, let's generate a dialogue from query. So let's start from a question. And then let's instruct a large language model like Palm to write a dialogue between an automated assistant and a user. And let's give Pound some few short examples showing how what is the style of the dialogue that we want. Let's give the, the Pound a few short examples from the target uh, domain. And then we need some automatic filters because Pound is good, but it doesn't always do what we want. We want filters to only keep dialogues that have the same intent as the search query that we started from, right? We want a search where we want a question and then we want the dialogue and we want the dialogue its intent and the question to have the, the same intent. So one of the filter is that, for example, here we started from a search query and we generated this dialogue. So this dialogue is a generated dialogue. And so from query, we reach this dialogue and then we can generate, we, we can reverse the few short order and generate a reverse query. So again, from query to dialogue, we then can reverse the order and generate a, another put Q tag, Q prime. And now we can compare Q and Q prime and see like what is the similarity between the query we started from and the reverse query we generated in two pound steps. And in this way, we can filter dialogues that have different intent. So this is basically this is the pipeline, and then we have like the a dialogue to search query, a query generation that data set, and then we can take models like lambda, bar, and pound, and uh, t5, and uh, fine tune it on these data sets and produce better query generation models. So after that, we take a, a, a dialogue and train it to predict the query. Okay, so this was a bit of a complex pipeline. Are there any questions? Yeah, so let's unpack the observation of a bias to query the dialogue. Yeah. Okay, but, 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 but
taking the full context here, like ending and end here, and tell me what other search queries might be relevant. So yeah, so this is the search query for this part. But like, if you end in this part, um, like usually there there is a single intent. Yeah. Uh, you need you mean the prompt propagator, right? Yeah. Um, so we didn't see anything that will produce a data for our specific problem, which is the query generation one. Yeah, but like eventually we have dialogues and we need to, to, to produce, to provide a model that better generates the query. So the, this is our like framework. But how, how will we, how will it uh, produce a dial, a query from a dialogue? This is the question. Yeah, but, but we need the, uh, like we received a very structural uh, problem yeah. from like the Lambda team. Your task is to better generate the, the query from this dialogue. So yeah, we were a bit uh, in a limited, yeah, in a limited uh, place. Okay, cool. Now we talked about the pipeline. Uh, now let's see a use case, how we can replace human annotated data. So we take the QREC model and uh, we only took 15 few shot examples. So we take 15 examples from the target domain and we use it as few shots for pump. Um, and we generated a 30K samples. And importantly, all of the questions from um, uh, that we had are disjoint from QREC. So we only use 15 examples from QREC, but we use nothing more from the target domain, just to understand the style and the flow of the dialogues there. And we then fine tuned T5 and Lambda. And the test set is the original human annotated test set. We didn't change the test set, the test set is the same. And these are two dialogues uh, from the same question. Like one is a human annotated and one is a generated, synthetically generated. And can you guess what is the synthetically generated there? Okay, so the left one is, I actually never remember what is the answer for this one, but we also showed like humans, this task, and they had like 50% uh, chance, so not better than random chance. Uh, bottom line is that the generated dialogues look, look natural to, to humans. And then again, okay, and then we took the models, the T5 and Lambda, and we had the training set, like the human annotated training set and the auto-generated training set, and we take uh, several metrics, evaluation metrics, uh, expert similarity between the generated queries and rouge one recall and search results. Uh, we look on like the search URLs that come back from a uh, Google search. And again, as you can see in, in, in the brackets, we generate, we reach between 90 and 97% of the performance uh, using the synthetic data. So yeah, we can like tell a QREC and Apple that generated the, uh, the QREC data set, you, you didn't have uh, to, you didn't have to uh, annotate so much data and pay so much money for annotators. You could only use uh, 15 examples and uh, create an almost comparable data set uh, for query generation. So this is the bottom line here. <laughs> Yeah, this is correct. So yeah, the QREC uh, scenario is just to demonstrate uh, the potential of this method because and, and like the, the money is already spent and we don't like cry over a uh, spilled uh, milk. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, 
Yes, I agree. Now, another case is what can we do now when we have a new a new type of uh, domain, okay? New domain and, and challenging scenarios and we can use Q2D to generate data. So like in the paper, we show a, a case with multi-hop QA, but I want to actually better uh, describe a, a case we had in Google where we had dialogues which with uh, YouTube URLs in the dialogues, for example, what, what, who is your favorite singer? Uh, mine is Adele. Oh, great, that's nice. Give me her latest song. And the model provides like a URL with the latest song by Adele. And the Lambda model really struggled when he received this URL that he never saw on the training. So again, the same case, we could have uh, used human annotation to annotate and uh, match much data uh, for his task. But we used Q2D. Um, and yeah, and it, Q2D actually produced also like a test set and also a train set for his task. And it uh, was finally like inserted in the, in the product. So this is a, a successful demonstration of Q2D uh, in the real world. And yeah, so they tried several, uh, several options. Like I, I'm not, I, like I just uh, escorted this uh, process from the Q2D side, but uh, they found Q2D to be, to be effective and they used it. Okay, cool. Now let's come back to whoops. And I want to ask you again, what makes these images weird? So coming back to the weird images. What? Uh, so right. Okay. So iPhone, a uh, uh, smartphone were, didn't exist when other time and was alive. And this one? Yeah. Yeah. Air. Okay. Yeah. And the uh, um, candle needs a constant supply of oxygen to burn in, uh, and it doesn't happen in a sealed bottle. And wolf usually howl during the, the night or full moon and not in a broad daylight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so again, we wanted to invent some kind of a new task to challenge a vision and language a common sense understanding. And these kind of weird images, and we thought about these weird images that also exist in the wild. For example, this image from the latest World Cup showing a Messi and Ronaldo playing chess. And it really intrigued people during the World Cup because their competition usually happened in the soccer field and not in a game of chess. And for example, in this one, and there is a monitor uh, with a fire displayed inside a fireplace rather than real fire. And actually, GPT-4 was released in the same day as Whoops. And it had the, the, instant, the example of what is unusual about this image. So we were happy to see it uh, because we already had like a full data set about this task. So the way, how, how can we generate this kind of common sense defined images or find like these kind of images? These images don't, don't really, like they depict uh, scenarios that don't really exist, right? What is the task to say whether it's um, Yeah, so actually we have we have few tasks, but like one, like our main task, I think, and like the most uh, novel and interesting one is to explain what makes the image weird, like to explain what, is the what what is common sense defined in the given image? So it also requires like a model and humans to recognize what is in the image, to read about it, to understand why it is like anomaly in the real world. Uh, so it really requires a lot. So we thought about this as a really nice task to challenge and measure the uh, understanding of the models. Okay, so we hired designers that use step to image models like MidJourney. So we had a group of over 30 designers and they were instructed to generate common sense defined images. So it also MidJourney and DALI and Stable Diffusion. So how can we create these kind of weird images? Let's think about a prompt uh, that uh, visualizes like normal image, like the guitarist slash playing a guitar. Now let's switch one of the elements to be something that is unlikely to exist, like instead of a guitar, a saxophone. And this way we got this image, the guitarist slash playing the saxophone. 
So, and, and now we can ask what makes this image strange, uh, weird, and receive the explanation that Slash is known for playing the guitar, not the saxophone. So this is how we generated uh, many cases of common sense defined images, like we generated 500 images. Um, how did we hire them? Yeah. Facebook. <laughs> we said no, we, we searched for uh, like uh, expert designers because generating each one of these cases, it is not writing, uh, give me an image of Slash playing the saxophone. Uh, each image has like a very long process and you need to change and like to so play with the prompts. Still music yeah. Yeah. yeah, we had like a WhatsApp group as well. And we had like a, a manager of these uh, designers. Yeah, so we generated 500 images, uh, collected 500. And again, this is very challenging to even generate one. And these are from, uh, we did check that they are from uh, various categories. For example, we have one with uh, atypical behavior. So this is a cat jumping to a tennis ball like a dog. And a object shape, this is a glove with six fingers, a age mismatch, safety, a cultural knowledge. So these are little girls crying on Disneyland. It's funny that like, Six fingers, like they really, yeah. it would be really hard for them to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the six figures one is a, is a funny one. And, and yeah, this way we generated images. So these are only the images. Now we want annotations, right? We want actual annotations. So uh, we now had a Amazon Mechanical Turk task to annotate uh, the images. So the first one is the first task is explanation generation. Given this. With the image, five human annotators wrote what made this image weird. And in this case, if the pandas live in the China bamboo forest that sits almost entirely on bamboo and do not hunt salmon fish like the grizzly bears. And we also have like three established vision and language tasks like image captioning, cross model matching, and VQA. And for example, in the VQA case, case uh, we have a question what is catching salmon in a stream? And we want to tempt the VQA model to say bear, which might be correct, but this is like under specified. The real answer that we want is a panda bear. So this way we co Janet collected like more than 10K annotations for the Whoops data set. A lot of common sense. No. Uh, what? Not just common sense, like our knowledge and knowledge questions. Uh, yeah, so we refer to all cases as Common sense. So, so this is this isn't our knowledge. What 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 is really about this image? It's actually a parallel. Yeah, right. So this is not a parallel area, right? This is a hook. Uh, and yeah, so the, we call this like you need. Yeah. So yeah, okay. Yeah, world knowledge as well. Yeah, for, uh, this is correct. This is not, not only common sense when I think about it. Okay, cool. And then we developed a uh, model to solve this task. And now I'm just focusing on the explanation of violation task, like the what makes this image weird task, because this is the most interesting one. And we have uh, models that are end to end, like taking a blip to model, a vision and language model. Um, and when we activate it, like just asking it what makes the image weird, it produces some incorrect uh, prediction. So this is one approach. But we then fine tuned live to on our data. So end-to-end -end fine tuning is uh, another approach. And another approach is a, a Python approach. When we take the blip to caption, like the wolf howling at the sky, and then ask GPT-3 to explain. And this is before like all mini GPT-4 and this kind of models existed. And a wolf howling at the sky is not a typical behavior of a wild wolf, but this explanation is not really what we want. It is a bit under specified. And we have another uh, approach, which is actually an oracle approach, where we take the groundless caption, the caption that was annotated by the Amazon Mechanical Talk workers. And again, this caption is human created. It does not exist in inference time. Uh, but using this caption, we are able to know what is the limits of a text only approach. So this, this pipeline does not really uh, do anything with the image. It, it uses the ground to captures from the Amazon Mechanical Turk workers. But then uh, we can see a wall following the top of the rock facing the sun. 
and then we can see the GPT-3 explanation um, because wolves are usually most active during the day and like receiving a better explanation. Yeah, it was the, like the most the state of the art model uh, one day before GPT-4 uh, was released in the 14th on March. Uh, I don't remember, but we did use the tag in CA3. Okay, uh, and here we can see the results table, and we ha we can see the end to end model. So um, and the explanation task, the metric is human rating. Uh, so we had humans to say whether the explanation is correct or not, and the zero shot model, zero shot model so receives. It's but it's, if you're saying it's the Vinci, the Vinci zero three, you're you're writing the GPT three, it's wrong because it's it's contained of two point five. Yeah, this is correct. You're correct. Um, so yeah, zero shot model were not good at all. Uh, end to end model was a bit better, uh, achieving 27% accuracy, but still very low. The pipeline model is a bit better as well, reaching 33. And the Oracle model achieves 68, while the humans achieve much higher, 95. Now notice that this 33% is actually like the limitation of a pipeline of captioning plus a GPT-3 approach. And the gap between this 33 and 68 is where like captioning models can improve. So this is like a recognition gap. When we have the, like, uh, the best, best possible captioning model, the results will still be 68. And the gap between 68 and 95 is a textual or reasoning gap. And this is the gap where Better models, language models like uh, GPT-4 and above, uh, can try to address. Did you try as an oracle of text only, like humans try to identify what is uh, the common sense talk based only on the text? Um, based only on the text. Because we know no. that the large language models have a lot of faults when it comes to common sense reasoning. Yeah. So the, the 68 to 95 percent might be even a smaller gap if you let humans see that. Uh, yeah. The, yeah. So we didn't try uh, humans, but we did have like humans uh, to generate the captions and to generate like the human created captions. Uh, the captions must uh, describe the two elements that make the image weird. For example, it must contain a panda and a hunting uh, for salmon fish in the river. And we also had like um, um, the task of humans to explain what makes the image weird based only on the on the image, but we didn't have the baseline that you you described. Is it worth trying? Because you're you're treating 68 as the upper bound of what you can get based solely on the text, and it may be that GPT-3 is just not strong enough, and the human being would uh, succeed better. Yeah. Text. Yeah, I agree, and we also like received uh, some kind of uh, feedback in the review, and like I say, in the 15th uh, of July, we should have the final answers in from ICCD. Um, and yeah, and they asked why didn't you use stronger models like GPT-4, and I responded, okay, GPT-4 wasn't available when we submitted it, uh, but yeah, yeah. So it it was an easy easy response for the reviewer. Okay, uh, cool. And here are some uh, predictions. Uh, the Statue of Liberty, this is from the end to end model. The Statue of Liberty is in New York, not Sydney. Babies are too young to read books. And the Cookie Monster eats cookies, not apples. Cool. And um, we also have some, uh, I will just uh, go over it really quickly. We have an analysis that's showing that the main challenge is the weirdness and not the synthetic aspect of the images because then we have like two two challenges one synthetic generation two common sense challenge so we have the strange images like this is a ice skates on a bus like for cat wooden for cat and we also have normal images that are also generated but without the common sense defined aspect and we then have natural images that are just like normal images taken with camera and this way we were able to see 
that the performance on these two columns uh, in image captioning is very high, like 89%, but the only struggle is in this case. So in this case, uh, the results are 49% showing like a very underspecified caption. Okay, so welcome to check uh, the benchmark and the flower and seeing all of the whoops instances uh, and annotations. Okay, um, another uh, quick work is what you see is, um, okay, how many time do I have left? I can finish in seven minutes, I guess. In general, uh, like you can push to 3.30 if you want. Okay, now I can uh, do uh, sooner than that. Okay. I think you're like 10 minutes. Okay, okay um, I want to ask you is what you see is what you read. No. Okay, now why? Okay, this is a, a, a cat and not a dog. This is an easy one. And oh, okay, so this is the task of image text alignment. Um, so we generated is we created C2, a comprehensive benchmark for this task. And C2 is composed of all cases of real and synthetic images and texts. Okay? So we have like um, also synthetic images and synthetic te text and synthetic images and real text and, and so on. And we developed and offered two effective methods, a zero-shot VQA-based approach and a synthetically trained uh, fine-tuned model. And both of our approach, approaches uh, surpassing previous baselines and effective in text-to-image ranking. So this is uh, like the idea of this work. Okay, so the first work, um, again, the task is to say whether this image fits to this text. So uh, we start from, um, um, a Q squared work by O. Honovich from this lab. Um, so we generate for this caption, this caption, we generate several QA pairs which are based on the text. For example, besides a green backpack, what else is in the picture? And the answer candidate is a black apple. And then we use like the VQA model and ask it. Uh, whether the textual information is correct. So again, this question and answer are based only on the textual information. And now we use the VQA model to intersect this with the visual information. The, and this is how we compare the text with the image. So we have this kind of a score for each instance, and then we aggregate uh, the final uh, VQA score. So this is the zero shot approach. Now we also have a, another approach, an end-to-end -end approach, where um, the way we generated c truth is, again, we wanted um, synthetic and natural images and text. So we have a method, we call it congen, where we start from cocoa, cocoa captions, like a, a knife sitting next to carrots on top of a cutting board, and congen makes a perturbation, a minimal change similar to the contrast that we showed earlier, uh, changing to a spoon instead of a knife sitting next to carrots on top of a cutting board. So this is a case of natural images and natural text. And then we had case where with synthetic images, where we start from uh, images from like a peak, pick a peak data set by uh, Yuval uh, from your lab, and we generate captions a yellow and a black bus cruising uh, through the rainforest. And then we use the same content method to make this minimal perturbation. And we will show in a bit how this content works. And finally, we take a text to image models like Imagine and a Stable Diffusion and similar to start from natural prompts and generate images and then to auto label the images using our VQ squared approach from before. So these are methods to generate data for this task. And for the C2, for the test set, we had human evaluation, human annotators uh, actually say what is the label for each instance. But again, this is an automatic method to create silver training data. 
So we used it to generate train sets, a uh, large train sets for our task. So the, the, the second approach is just to fine tune um, partly like a vision and language uh, model on the data that was generated from this type of uh, gener um, synthetically generated uh, data. Okay, and content, like the way content works is we take Coco captions, okay? We take uh, we take like five captions, whether it's from Coco or whether it's from a uh, generated, like predicted captions. And then we tell the LLM, provide a caption that contradicts all context captions by making a minimal change in the input caption. Now, the LLM, when we use Palm, it provides us with a candidates contradicting candidates, but we then want to find the caption that is the most contradicting. So we then take the NLI model, and the NLI model task is to select the generated caption with the lowest attainment score. So we have some kind of score for each of the generated candidates, and this one has the lowest attainment score, so this one is the most contradicting caption. So this one is a Ford Mustang sports car driving down a road in the desert. And this is not like, this is the most contradicting case because this is like a Dodge Viper and not a Ford Mustang. Okay, uh, this is a bit, uh, this was a bit uh, long. So any questions about how we generated training data for the end-to-end -end model or about like the, the congen method and this pipeline? It's not common to do chain of thought for what kind of uh, chain of thought? Very good questions, intermediate questions, um, answer each of them with the model, like instead of the Q to B. Um, but for which, like, the like task? Instead of using the intermediate model to solve the task, mm -hmm. the previous slide, you could have just done chain of thought, right? Okay, so, like, the, the task is to say, like, uh, what is the score from of this, like, what is the alignment score between this and this? Yeah, like, in the next slide, right? Yeah. Yeah, so here we do the big Q score score, but you could just put it down like user like application is a yeah, so like the Q, the Q squared is like it does generate many QA pairs, like around 30 for each. Yeah, yeah, and this might make sense um, to, to do it like iteratively and expanding the questions when we go on. Uh, I agree. Um, yeah, but the big Q squared uh, works as well. Okay, cool. So here are the results. A table. So we have several models. We have Clip, Coca, Blip1, Blip2, a Poly, Tifa, and this is our zero shot method. And these are a end to end models. And here we have like the data sets in situ in our test set. Again, real, all cases of real and synthetic images and prompts. And we have SNI VE, wheel ground, grow bench, edit bench, a Coco text image and two data sets, we, um, we call them CocoCon and PikaPikCon, like with contradictions. Um, and these are the results. And generally we see that like our zero shot method is the best out of the zero shot methods um, available, especially in the case of uh, synthetic images. So we can see like the gap, like above 80 and everyone else is basically between 60 and 70. <clears throat> Um, and our end-to-end -end model is better than our zero-shot model. We can look here. Our end-to-end -end model is better than our zero-shot model. And finally, we also have like an ensemble, ensemble of just averaging the scores by the end-to-end -end and the zero-shot approach. And it is uh, it was the best uh, approach. So the, the results are pretty. Uh, so we received uh, good results compared to the baselines in this work. Uh, any questions? Okay, and we also show that we can use our method to automatically score uh, rank candidates in text to image generation. 
So we had a problem. So a brown and white cat is in a suitcase. And here, this is the clip ranking. So clip said that this is the best, uh, most similar method. This is the second, this is the third, and this is the fourth. And the ranking that you see is the ranking why the DQ squared and the poly, like our end to end model. And you can see that, like, this image really show a brown and white cat in a suitcase. And this image, this is, isn't a brown and white cat. This is actually only white cat. And, and yeah, so we had like a result over several models and several data sets. OK. And I will also just mention very quickly, we also had another work that is not published yet. But the work is about it's called it's called a visit bench, a dynamic benchmark for evaluating instruction following vision and language models. And just hinting about this this work very quickly, um, it is about taking two can it, two model predictions like Panda GPT and Instruct Blip, like taking the state of the art uh, instruction following vision and language models, and we have some kind of judge like a, like a GPT four judge, and the judge runs which model is the winner. So in this case, we build an ELO, ELO based ranking system and leaderboard to dynamically rank vision and language models. Yes, yeah, and the, the, um, the ranking, the, the, the judge is a model based. And the model based is using, like you can see here, a, a dense caption that really describes what is in the image. So this is a reference free, and we also have a reference based. So we have, again, we have like a, a, an instruction, create a catchy title for a country song based on, upon the advice printed on the wheelchair, uh, on the wheel cover. And, and the advice is quit your job, buy a ticket, get a tan, fall in love, and never retire, I think. Yeah. And we have like the Llama adapter prediction and mini GPT-4 prediction. And uh, then we have the judge, and this is a reference based. So we also have the ground rules response in addition to the dance caption, mm -hmm. which is called what's in the image. And the winner in this case is the Lama adapter. And we show, like, uh, we provide the leaderboard for all vision and language uh, instruction following models. And we also show the correlation between the leaderboard and the human uh, annotation, like the, the preferences by humans. So Yes, yeah, so actually this is something that so far we did like a, only A better than B or B better than A, but now we are talking about maybe to do what you propose and we think that it, it might be better and worth the investment of re-annotating this and we still didn't publish it, but we will probably do it. Okay, uh, so uh, I thank all the uh, great collaborators I had in this uh, work and especially my supervisors, the Real Stanowski and Roy Schwartz. And like the takeaways, and your wife. yes, and, and, and your time wife. wife, of course. And, and the takeaway is that multimodal reasoning is crucial for real world applications. We encourage to explore novel methods and challenging tasks to expand the current boundaries. High quality data sets enable better AI. And synthetic data generation, leveraging semantic inputs, LLMs, and text to image models are key to building such data sets. Thank you very much.